Ladies and gentlemen, we are live, Myth Vision Podcast. I'm excited about this episode. To give you just a real sneak peek as to why, I was a young earth creationist who believed the earth was only six, 7,000 years old. The Bible taught that God created the heavens and the earth. So my rule or standard was the Bible says, and then the world around me needed to be observed. My call, or My high school teacher, Mr. Pope, I'm trying to get in contact with him again. He was a uh, biology teacher. I'm trying to let him know like, hey, dude, now I think that we did evolve. OK, I, I, I've come around. He flunked me in high school in the 10th grade because I wouldn't answer the questions on a multiple choice about evolution because I believed that, no, we were made in the image of God. And I did not evolve. I did not come from some monkey, as I understood it. Why are there still monkeys around if we come from monkeys? Or like the ridiculous things I thought, because I just didn't know. So today we're going to have per Professor Dave. He's going to be explaining evolution from abiogenesis down to what we are today. And is it plausible? Does this make the most sense? Are theistic uh, propositions or alien extraterrestrial propositions more ad hoc? Seems to me they are, but. Look, let's let him explain these things. And first, I'm going to go ahead and give you guys an intro. In case you were wondering, I used to chase the gods. Like, that was my thing. But listen, now that I'm Myth Vision, the gods chase me. Check it out. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Professor Dave Farina, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correct, is joining us here, and we're going to be talking about a hot topic. What's up, man? Welcome. Howdy. That's a flashy intro, man. I got to give you one of those. That's pretty slick. I got a good friend who can make one for you if you're interested. Um, I'll, I'll chat with him, yeah. <laughs> really, really catchy with it. Uh, Jonathan Sheffield, man. Thanks for the intro, my friend. Um Look, I, I, I got to tell you, even sometimes today, it's like almost like what you're raised to believe for so long. It almost seems in our own head difficult to swallow that we as complex as we are today could come from simple organic compounds, you know, something like from different chemistry, if you will, using the term different elements that over certain conditions in certain places over a certain amount of time mm -hmm. here we become very simple organic compounds into the complexity that we are today. It almost seems like a theist would go, well, dude, don't you see there's a hand of God at work here. Now, before we even get into anything, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to do a little uh, intro letting mm -hmm. Dr. Tor make a statement. Cause one of the most popular videos he did that caught my attention, the stuff he knows is way over my head. I'm not a chemist, right? I have no clue. I'm computer. I mean, I'm scientifically illiterate. So I figure I'd let just this little intro play, and then I'd like to let everyone know how they can go and check you out and then get in the conversation if you're okay sure. with that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So you know this video quite well, I'm sure, and anyone who's probably a theist interested in this discussion knows, and here we are. Are you an expert on origin of life? I'm a synthetic organic chemist. Origin of life is purely synthetic organic chemistry. There's no way around it. I'm perfectly situated to be commenting on this, to be critiquing the origin of life research. It is abiological. It is before biology takes over. This is purely synthetic organic chemistry. And making these compounds, it's very simple. Four classes of compounds. You have to make them from what's available on a presumed prebiotic earth. And so the chemistry is not hard. In case anyone's wondering, 
there are, there are two part series that Dr. Dave responds to this and like thoroughly responds to this. So, and it's down in the description. You can go watch the three videos he has an initial one on pretty much what, what, what's the guy's motives here. And then the other two is like directly responding to the, to the critiques from Dr. James Tor to Dave. Sorry for synthetic Dave. organic chemist to follow. And, any sy trained synthetic organic chemist can follow me on this. And I've never seen a synthetic organic chemist disagree with me on this. In fact, the people that might disagree with me are biologists because they've never made anything. The only thing they may have made is they buy a kit and they make it, which is made by chemists, but they've never made anything ab initio. And so it's the synthetic chemist that can critique origin of life research better than anyone else. So go ahead, ask your synthetic chemist friends to listen to what I have to say. If they have anywhere a master's degree or beyond in synthetic organic chemistry, have them critique what I say. Well, that's exactly what happened. And so <laughs> Dr. Dave says, well, I have a master's degree and I think I'll go ahead and do a crit critique. And you did. So how has the responses to your critique uh, been? Have they been? Yeah, I mean, uh, okay, where do we start? I mean, um, <laughs> the, the, the response is, okay, so I mean, just first of all, to backtrack, I, I didn't know we were going to, yeah, that's the video that I had seen many, many times, which prompted me to <clears throat> make an initial 45-minute video um, for lay people, you know, just kind of like, I found this video and this guy, it's not, you know, these are not accurate statements. Um, and then he was so triggered by that, that he made a 14 part series about how dumb I am. Uh, oh so gosh. obviously that got me riled up a bit. So I, then I really dug in and, uh, you know, because he was playing the game of, he was playing the credentials game. You know, I, I know I'm a chemist, you're dumb and, uh, you don't know what you're talking about. So I did a two part series, you know, two and a half hours digging into 50 pay, 50 plus papers and interviewing researchers on the origin of life. It's just really dismantling because you know, in the end, he's just an apologist. And I mean, he's a liar, quite frankly. Um, and it all can boil down to that very first statement that you just played. The origin of uh, the origin of life is purely synthetic organic chemistry. No, it's not. It isn't. <laughs> and uh, he he either knows that and is lying or um it, or or truly is that clueless and 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 kind of ego driven to to uh, present himself as an expert in a field where he really does not i mean he truly does not understand the field beyond his beyond his script of lies he really does not understand he doesn't understand systems chemistry doesn't understand geochemistry doesn't understand astrochemistry so he's, he's really not an expert i mean he's not in the field he, he's he doesn't understand origin of life uh, research so um yeah, so I, I had to go in and and, and kind of like I did that first video. Then when he, you know, he basically has that this kind of script. Uh, he has these certain talking points, and you know, one of them is you know earlier you you were talking about I, what I wanted to respond to what you said uh, right at the very beginning, where you're talking about um, you know it, from a theistic perspective, the complexity of life, right, would seem to suggest a, a designer. And I, I just couldn't disagree more. I, I think that uh, complexity is not the hallmark of, of design. Simplicity is the hallmark of design, right? When you use a, you know, like an iPad or something like that, you know, the, the hallmark, it, it, we, we can tell that it was designed because of how simple it is, right? There's one little button and you do just, it's, it's very uh, intuitive, right? Um, life is not like that. Life is ex exceedingly complex um, due to the random nature of its formation. So um, anyway, I, I don't I don't know how far I didn't know where we were going to go with this conversation. I don't know how <laughs> much into the weeds you want to get with my tour response. I'm happy to talk about uh, any any of it. Um, but yeah, just guide me. Let me know what you want to yeah, no, discuss. No, look, I already know you can go into the weeds. I like <laughs> I trust me. Anyone who watches any of your videos can know like you don't you don't leave any stone unturned trying to evaluate the information. And one of the things I respect about you in our conversation, even before I hit record was if I'm wrong, I'm just going to say, or if I don't know, I'm going to say like, like I, I don't know, or yeah. we don't know. So real quick, how the hell did you get 1.45 million subscribers? Uh, I need the, the, the special juice that you have. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it all started, I, st I, I uh, this was 2014, I, I was trying to look for some ways of uh, making some passive income, uh, so I could sustain, you know, I was, I was more into music at the time, and uh, wanted some some passive revenue, uh, passive income uh, revenue stream, and um, so I, I heard some people were throwing uh, educational content up on YouTube, and you could make money that way, and uh, I had, excuse me, uh, just been 
teaching organic chemistry at a trade university. So for about four years, I was lecturing uh, organic chemistry. And uh, so I had kind of like, I, I had honed those uh, those lectures. I, I, I had designed my course and I'd gotten, gotten really good over eight or nine semesters of, of teaching that, that um, I, I could really deliver that content really well. So so I filmed uh, my OCHEM lectures just like with a with a whiteboard and writing, you know, just basically like I was teaching my class. You know, and, and I put those up, a little bit of branding and things. And uh, people really liked them. At the time, there was not very much uh, OCHEM stuff up there. There was like Khan Academy, maybe one or two other things. So people thought, wow, this is this is great. You know, you should do more. So I started to do general chemistry. Then I did some animations, you know, uh, with green screen and everything. And then I just kept going from there. Uh, and I've always just tried to deliver the uh you know the learning objectives the topics that high school and undergrad students are are learning in class with uh, extreme clarity succinctness just this is what you're learning in class and you know maybe you 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 don't like reading textbooks or your instructor maybe isn't that clear or maybe they are and it's just really hard and you just you need a little more help and um so you know here's a little video this is what you learned today and and this is it can't get clearer than this and so um, that's sort of been the basis of my channel for a long time. Then, re, you know, in the past couple of years, I started to get a little bit of the debunking stuff. So that's been a newer uh, avenue for me, which I really enjoy. Um, not as many people seem to be down for the amount of effort. The tour thing was the the most work I've ever done. I mean, to go back to what you're saying, um, I'm, I'm definitely not like t like tour has more expertise than I do in chemistry. Obviously, right. he's right. a chemist. Um, but I am trained. I mean, I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry. I did most of a master's in synthetic organic chemistry. Then I switched over to science education uh, to get the degree. But, um, you know, I know how to read papers. I, they're comprehensible to me, sometimes with some difficulty. But, you know, I, I understand chemistry. You can't like, uh, it, it's not gibberish to me. I may have to look into stuff a little bit, but I, I understand the fundamentals very well and I explain them very well. Um, and so, you know, a lot of his claims a lot of his claims are blatantly false at face value, but then a lot of his claims require that you look into literature and find examples in literature that contradict what he's saying. And so, you know, he, <laughs> with his 14 part series, quite predictably, he leaned on his laurels a lot and like, look, I'm this really great chemist. Obviously I'm right. And this bozo's wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's just sort of a facade that he uses to, um, you know, he, he'll, he'll regularly go on these long tangents where he just uses the terminology in his field that he understands very well, but is nevertheless completely uh, irrelevant to abiogenesis. He'll go, he'll talk for half an hour about like, uh, you know, carbohydrate synthesis, that they're not even natural products. Like it's just, it's literally not related <laughs> to abiogenesis at all. But because he is smart and he knows what he's talking about, people are like, well, he must be right about everything he says. Well, he's explaining that synthesis, but it's just, it doesn't have anything to do with anything. So, you know, I had to, uh, it, like my video was for lay people. His was taking the, the approach of like, I know so much, look at all these papers I can reference, but he's lying when he references them. So then for my response, obviously I had to go way beyond what it was for the lay people. And so for, for my response videos, a lot of people, it's probably going over their head as well. They, they can listen to James. They can listen to me. They don't understand what either of us are saying. Yeah, but we're you do talking the visuals. About... You, you actually yeah. show quite a bit of visuals. And I, and I doesn't mean I understand mm -hmm. all that you're saying, but with the visuals and what you were trying to explain, I could keep up, you know? And, and I mean, yeah. not everyone maybe can, but real quick, if you don't mind, before we continue, I want to sure. let everyone know they can also go check you out on Patreon. Is there anything specific that you do with your Patreon or is this just for people who like support you? Or yeah. To be honest, I don't do too much. It was just people wanted some, uh, wanted a way to support. Like if they, you know, if I save them a lot of money in tutoring or something like that, um, Oh, wow. They okay. can go offer because it's like, you know, it, I, my tutorials can serve almost like tutoring. It's Got not it. per, it's not personalized, but it's, uh, you know, if you need help with a particular topic. So there's just, you know, people who like a particular creator have attended, you know, some uh, if they can afford it. I, I know a lot of students can't afford it. So it's like, right. <laughs> like, I don't this is strictly if you want to. Also, um, what's this thing right here? What's oh, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I wrote a book uh, last year. It actually came out in March. Uh, is this Wi-Fi organic? So it kind of combines the two things I do. So it, it's uh, there's sort of uh, chapters that condense the truly indispensable information in chemistry, biochemistry, biology, and physics, uh, and then applies them towards kind of identifying misinformation in pseudoscience. So it's really like a pocket guide. It's pretty short. It's a, it's a quick read. You could you could knock it out like you know JFK to L LAX <laughs> pretty quick. Um, <laughs> And it's just like if you if you really want those basics, like 
uh, because I find that, um, you know, a lot of people who fall for misinformation or pseudoscience, it, it could be avoided if they simply knew the basics about like, you know, what is DNA and what does it do? What is a cell? How, what are cellular uh, processes all about? What is a molecule? What are the properties of molecules? You know, really basic stuff. Um, so yeah, it kind of combines the two things I do. I, I, cause I, I do, I do need everybody to have that basic information, the very basic, you know, we're talking about ninth, 10th grade understanding. Right. Uh, of of certain principles and then apply them to this is a scam this is uh you know this the whole alt health industry is preying on chemophobia and you know identifying anti-establishment narratives and, and disarming them things like that wow powerful self-plug here if you don't know already join our patreon there are tons and tons of videos that have not been released to the public that you know will eventually one day make it to the uh to the light of youtube I'm also, I also started a podcast. So in a few days I'll be launching that. That'll be on Apple, iTunes, um, you know, Spotify, you name it for the channel and audio. So you could download it. It's been forever. I mean, I've been called myth fishing podcast for like three years and haven't had a podcast. So now we finally are, uh, but yeah, come join us, uh, support us on Patreon. If you like what we do here at myth fishing, thank you so much for that, Dr. Dave. All right. So first question I'd like to ask is, would you be, and this is irrelevant to the whole like arguments yet. But I've heard Dr. James say, um, I'll debate anyone, or he supposedly issued a debate to you, but you won't debate him or something like that. Would you be willing to debate him? Or if not, I mean, why not? I don't know. First of all, I just find it hilarious. Like I heard this through the grapevine. Like <laughs> it, it, you, it really demonstrates the, the, the pageantry of the offer. Nobody contact me directly. Like you'd think he'd like email me or something. My email is very readily available if he really wanted to interact with me. Um, no, he's, he's just grandstanding, um, you know, because he isn't capable of issuing a response to my response to him because it's extremely thorough <laughs> and uh, really, really picks apart his script and, and shows the invalidity of all of his talking points. Um, uh, and so he just, you know, he needs a way to uh, pretend that he's that he's above it, <laughs> you know. Um, there's nothing to debate. The, I'm sorry. Would you say he's the leading theistic uh, proponent on this whole thing and in the world right now? Uh, I mean, I think he's the leading theistic detractor of origin of life research. Um, that's why I felt like going after him because um, you know he had been essentially unchallenged. I had not, I didn't, I couldn't find any content um, refuting his claims on YouTube. So I thought, well, I guess I better do it because nobody else seems to be doing it. Like the, the stuff the guy says is insane. I mean, he's lying. So somebody should say so. Uh, and I think that's why he got so triggered and so threatened by that initial video I made because, you know, it got a couple hundred thousand views. And so I think everybody at Discovery Institute was like, James, you got to do something because, you know, this guy's you know, <laughs> he's countering your claims, you, you know, you got to save face. Um, so he did this <laughs> ridiculous stunt. I mean, I was kind of flabbergasted. Like it was just a recycling of all his talking points, but just Dave is dumb. Dave is dumb. Dave is dumb <laughs> every 10 seconds. And it's like, he said those okay. words. I haven't even watched this 14 part series, but does he kind of uh, say those words? Or he, not acts dumb. Like dumb? He, he calls me clueless. He has no idea what he's talking about. Uh, he keeps flashing a Dunning Kruger chart just because people speak confidently. doesn't mean they know a particular topic. It's like, dude, you're describing yourself. You have no clue what you're talking about. I mean, beyond <laughs> the dishonesty, I genuinely believe that there are areas of origin of life research. He just does not understand when he's talking about crystallizations and solid state chemicals chemistry and definitely geochemistry knows nothing about astrochemistry knows nothing about systems chemistry he i don't think he knew that systems chemistry exists like he tried to define autocatalysis and and kind of couldn't um and then just kind of ignores the whole field you know and and that is that's kind of the main thing with it with a biogenesis and that is what leads to these fallacious talking points that creationists put forward they'll say uh if origin of life is, you know, if abiogenesis is possible, why can't we observe it? Why haven't we observed it? And why can't scientists do it? Why can't scientists synthesize a cell? It's like, well, okay, I, I can see how in complete ignorance of, 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 of any scientific discipline, you might come to that conclusion. But the, the, the creation of synthetic life is not a goal of origin of life research. It's completely unrelated. There are other researchers like Craig Venter and a bunch of other people who work in synthetic life. And it's really fascinating area it has almost nothing to do with origin of life research because I think that what people do 
is they envision uh, nature, like the, they, they imagine that the proposition of abiogenesis is that a bunch of molecules floated together, boom, and there was a cell, and that was life. And that never happened. Nature didn't do that. Na that's not what happened in nature. So to expect a scientist to do that is the epitome of a straw man. It's ridiculous. So th this is what systems chemistry is all about. We're talking about systems of molecules, be they you know nucleic acids, proteins, and, and otherwise encapsulated in vesicles, going over uh, selection, going over oh, going over selection processes. We're talking about a kind of evolution over millions and millions of years until that system of molecules became became sophisticated enough to be called life. So origin of life research is about uh, elucidating those pathways. We're, we're looking at what was going on with those molecules. Um, and so people like Jack Shostak, uh, they're doing all this incredible work um, that, uh, that is, that is looking at the, the capacity for systems of molecules to evolve. They're, they're showing a kind of natural selection. Uh, and I cover a, a few of these papers in my series, certainly not all of them, but definitely some, some key ones. Um, and so, you know, it takes talking points, like when James says repeatedly, repeatedly with this religious fervor, there was no selection prior to life. There is no selection on the molecular level. Well, yeah, I'm sorry, you are objectively wrong. Here are studies exhibiting selection on the molecular level. So, um, you know, that was kind of what I wanted to do uh, was to, you know, it, it was obvious that my first video was not sufficient, I think, for people in his camp where I was doing it sort of a, for lay people, just uh, kind of surface level deconstructing some of his claims. But then it's like, all right, if you're going to play the game of here's all the papers, David and Shoney papers, all right, I got papers too, man. When you say, how do you do peptide formation uh, in water? Okay, here's a paper. It says peptide formation in aqueous solution. Like that's the title of the paper. So you're wrong and lying, you know? Um, you quote a lot of in the video, and I'm sure you are aware, and I'll just ask this for our audience who may not have seen this. Are there other scholars that this is their field of research who yeah. say this James guy is totally mistaken here? Yeah, all of them. All of them. All okay. of them know he's a complete clown. I, 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 I mean – uh, in order to make my response as good as it was, I did correspond with a number of origin of life researchers. So obviously a couple of them agreed to appear in the videos, but I talked to a lot more. I talked to most of them. Uh, I talked to most of the prominent ones. Um, and uh, mo the response from most of them was, and I won't name them by name because they didn't want to be involved in that video, was just like, look, this guy's a fraud. We support what you're doing. Send me the script. I'll look over it. You know, I'll send you a couple papers. You know, like oh, when you talk about this here, here's a paper that supports what you're saying, so you can use that. So I had a little bit of uh, coaching from them, and well, not coaching, but just like they help reinforce. The, they want to see this kind of rhetoric squashed as well. You know, mm -hmm. because it's not conducive to to uh, it's it 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 sullies public perception of science, right? James wants everyone to believe that all origin of life researchers in the world are co either corrupt or stupid, right? That they don't understand. And him who's not in the field knows better than all of them, right? That's the narrative that he's trying to spin here, because, which is insane. Because like his first statement, uh -huh. synthetic, organic. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's so, not. <laughs> it's just so real not. quick, for those in the chat who are obviously against everything Dr. Dave is saying, and there are people uh, who are going to disagree with you, and that's totally fine. I even tagged uh, Dr. James Tor in the in the title of this video i hope that okay. some of his followers will see this um because look uh, this is what i do i like to see the con the controversy test out what's going on here and let people consider it but they really should watch your series because you give visual representation of this and you show and cite the papers and stuff it's not just what dave has to say it is no. what it is what the field at That's large. The point. Yeah. It has nothing to do with, with me. I'm not an origin of life researcher. Neither is James, by the way. Um, I, it has nothing to do with me. I'm, I'm citing the literature that proves what he says is wrong. Right. And, uh, and I'm proving that by the way, you don't have to be an expert. You know, I'm not an expert. I, I have some specialized knowledge. I studied chemistry. I did some chemistry. I taught chemistry. So, you know, I, I'm well versed in the language of chemistry. I know what I'm talking about, but I'm not an expert. You know, James is an expert in his field. And if he was giving a lecture on how to how to build nano cars, <laughs> I'd gladly listen. He is an expert in how to build nano cars. Uh, that's you know, and if if that's all he ever talked about, I would praise him as a great scientist. But unfortunately, 
Um, you know, I, 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 as I'm not a psychologist, I can't say to what degree he is being deluded by his, by his belief system versus deliberate deception, uh, through the discovery Institute. You know, I don't really know how much he believes what he says, but, uh, what I can do is cite the literature that shows how he is objectively wrong. But yeah, um, this, this brings us to now that we're past the whole you can always uh, direct if you'd like to mention whatever he might say, because I think he's a lead example for theists who want to argue against abiogenesis. But yeah. for those of us who are mostly knuckleheads on this topic, who don't understand how the heck can you get life from different compounds uh, when we can't create it? Like we talked about this, you know, they had the Miller, the Miller movement or the Miller movement, the Miller, Miller experiment. Yes. That experiment. I remember in biology class as a theist, didn't believe in this. They were showing that under certain circumstances, putting heat and having pretty much what you have is like a bacteria develop. Uh, it, no. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, that's not right. It, it, uh, the Miller-Urey experiment, experiment produced uh, amino acids and that's some right. other biomolecules. So it's, See, I'm an idiot. it's literally the very, <laughs> very first step. So yeah, I mean, this is the thing, like a, a creationist could be justified in getting upset that uh, somebody uh, you know, supporting a naturalistic explanation for the origin of life would say Miller Urey experiment. Therefore it's all set. No, of course not. It was one tiny little thing. And that was the 1950s, by the way. But what James and some other people like to pretend is that the field hasn't progressed in seven years, which is insane. I mean, most of the papers I cited in my response were from the past decade. What has been done in the past decade alone is astounding. Um, and you know, uh, most of that, you know, a lot of that has to do with systems chemistry and, and, you know, other fields, but, um, the problem is that it, it's, it's really dense. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. dense. I was reading some of those papers in systems chemistry and just like, oh God. All right. Okay. Start again. Reach from the top. Let's try. It's, it's dense, you know? And so it's very easy for creationists to just go, well, that's not real. You know, it's too hard to understand. So it's not real, you know, but they don't understand James when he talks either. They have no clue what he's talking about. <laughs> he he <laughs> just they love get, it. Well, they love it. See, the problem is that with creationists, uh, you know, with with creationists, there are so few legitimate scientists that are in that on that, you know, in that camp. And so when they get one, they they try to build them up and praise them as the you know greatest scientists of all time. And, uh, you know, in James's case, the problem is that he is actually a good scientist, right? He's a good chemist. And so you know, you can imagine, you know, that's why he's the Discovery Institute's little darling is because he's a, he is a good scientist. It's so hard to find a good scientist that will that will spew this kind of rhetoric. But um, so, you know, that they that's why it becomes the credentials game. You know, people who come over to that those response videos, I mean, obviously they don't watch it. <laughs> they don't even press play uh, or they press play and get triggered really quickly and, and, and run away. But, um, you know, pretty much any comment D detracting on those videos says nothing concrete about the video makes no attempt to refute anything just says james is a brilliant chemist and you're not so he's right and you're wrong well all right man like right <laughs> i don't so know what that, to tell you in that in that vein of abiogenesis this is a question i get or a statement i'll see from the theists all the time that that first of all you don't know how it happened right uh, which is like meaning open the door because God probably zapped the first right. life or or you could say extraterrestrials. Like so. So what James says, as we played at the beginning, that this is synthetic uh, organic chemistry or whatever, um, like as someone built life, you have to have already existing life to build it. How do we go from non life to life? And maybe you can just kind of explain that as simple as possible. I know that's very complex ordeal to really explain this but you mentioned like astral chemistry and things like that like you're telling me that there were organic compounds in space that potentially have the form there are there are so organic tell us how all we, this kind of fits together if you'd want we can see through spectroscopic methods that there are organic compounds in space they're there i mean they're there so th those are basic building blocks i mean this has nothing to do with panspermia i mean the the idea of like extraterrestrials cultivating life i mean 2001 a space odyssey is my favorite movie of all time so it's a really cool idea but there's nothing you know that's some people can can study that but that's not something that i would propose per se um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of explained it earlier when I was talking about systems chemistry. I mean, you need the basic building blocks, the basic building, or as James calls them, the building blocks of the building blocks, the building blocks of the building blocks are omnipresent. They're everywhere. They're in space. They're very readily formed. They're very easy to form. We're talking about very small molecules with three, five atoms in them, you know, nothing, 
uh, nothing crazy. Um, but then they're they're all uh, the 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 building blocks, right? Your nucleic acids and your proteins, etc. They're polymers, so you need the little uh, the little units. You need them to polymerize, and so there's been plenty of studies showing. Uh, how this can happen for all of the uh, main classes of biomolecules. And then the real trick is uh, getting those, uh, I mean, once, uh, the, well, not the, the getting encapsulated in vesicles, that's no problem. That's, you know, uh, we're looking at spontaneous bilayer formation or monolayer. I mean, again, we're going to get into the weeds of, uh, you know, uh, the, the <laughs> gradients and everything. But um, yeah, most of it is systems chemistry. And this is that main straw man that I was talking about earlier of uh, creationists wanting a chemist to, go, okay, I put all these ingredients in and they made a cell. It's like, well, no, nature also didn't do that. <laughs> so that has nothing to do with what origin of life researchers are trying to do. You have other guys that are doing uh, other researchers that are researching synthetic life, and they will probably eventually succeed in synthesizing some form of life, but it will not have anything to do with, uh, with how abiogenesis occurred, right? Because that's designed. That's that's right. That's com something completely different. Um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, a, a, apart from what I said earlier about systems chemistry and how we're looking at selection on molecular level, right? When you have a system of molecules that is that is better suited towards uh, replication and en and energy production, it'll be selected for. So even though that system of molecules doesn't qualify as a living organism, we're still looking at selection on the molecular mm -hmm. level. It's just statistical dynamics, right? It, there, there's no there's no like divide, right? The 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 thing that that we've been learning over the past 20 years is that there's no uh, non-life and life right, and just like right. a, a line right here. It's actually, there's a spectrum, right? A physical chemical continuum. And it's, 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 it's blurry. We're not, it's, it, if we were to go back billions of years and watch the whole process, we, it would be pretty hard to go, okay, all right, now it's alive. That's, that's not that easy to do. Right. We know that a, that a, a couple of molecules is not life. And we know that a cell is life, but, you know, when you look at the first thing that would have qualified as a protocell, it's not that easy to define. So, you know, maybe later we'll have some challenges in terms of how we define life once if we get further with with uh, origin of life research. But um, Damn. yeah, systems chemistry, that's that's the key. So as far as <clears throat> the question of is abiogenesis the case, abiogenesis the case, it's not a question of is that the case? It's a matter of how did this happen how, and what in what manner is this the case in the in scientific uh -huh. uh, inquiry? Yeah. It's not like, well, did aliens bring us here? Now, of course, there's some people who think we were planted here, whatever. There's there's ideas out there. But as far and as in the field, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm just you finish up. No, as far as in the field, it's not a question of is abiogenesis true in some sense or did life originate naturally from completely organic compounds over a long period of time? That's not the question. It's just a matter of how it happened. Yes, because you're, I mean, you're describing science. I mean, the, the question in science is here's, you know, how do things happen? You know, life is here now, right? We know that. Right. So how did it get here? So uh, creationists want to want to pretend that there's, you know, in, in that there should be, uh, you know, that, that uh, if we, if we don't have a hundred percent viable naturalistic explanation, therefore God, right? Well, that's, that's the God of the gaps, right? We've been, we've been doing this for a very long time now, right? We used to not know anything. So everything was God's, you know, and then, oh, a volcano is, we understand magma and, you know, so that's not Hephaestus sitting in there making the thing. And that's why the, it's not that it's actually, we understand, you know, and rain and all the, and then the sun is not Helios. It's actually a star. And then, oh, look, the earth goes around where we started to learn things. And so the God of the gaps was, diminished and so uh you know there's really only two spots where the god of the gap still has a little bit of room and that's the origin of life and the origin of the universe and you know if you want to believe in a god see this is the thing that <laughs> makes me laugh the most about fundamentalist creationists is you believe in a dumb god you believe in a really lame god that like like if you believe in a god that triggered the initial singularity and then watched the universe progress that's fine. That doesn't bother me. Um, but if you if you want to pretend that the, your God was incapable of creating a universe with the conditions such that life could arise and then he had to kind of like wait a long time and then go, oh, ah, shoot, it's not happening. What should I do? Maybe I'll make this go over here. It's like, wh why do you believe in such a lame God? Um, I think the answer to that is that most of them don't believe in that God. They believe in the young earth creationist God. And so that's they're trying to feign compatibility with science to get there. But, um, 
yeah, just I, I just don't understand it at all. Like, why <laughs> God create a universe that's conducive to the formation of life if that's the kind of God you want to believe in, you know? Yeah, that um, was pretty. You just just took your shotgun mm-hmm. and. Um, I see but, sorry, why younger. To, to finish the point, though, the, the the point is that science, it, right? Is it people criticize science for being materialistic or something like that. Science is the study of the physical world, right? So right. we science does not resort to supernatural explanation ever. If you do that, it's not science. So this idea that you know, it's like, yeah, life is here. We're trying to figure out how it happened. So we've made a lot of progress and we have, um, you know, a, of course, no one is saying we know exactly what happened. That would be absurd. We do not and maybe never will. But we're, eluc- we're elucidating all of these plausible pathways for all of these characteristics of biomolecules and biological organisms to have arisen. And we're kind of filling it in. So it's like you have a jigsaw puzzle and, uh, you know, it's a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and you got 842 pieces in there. What is it? It's a hot air balloon. I can see that it's a hot air balloon. All right. I don't, I didn't fill in this top right corner here. We're not sure, you know, got to get some more pieces, but like we can see like based on what we know now, it is not insane or inconceivable that life can have arisen by natural, uh, by natural processes. You know, we have more to learn, but you know, we're not where we were 200 years ago where it's like, who knows? We don't know anything. You know, I think this is a great point you bring up about the baggage that we carry from ancient religions that are ov- often emotionally tied into us because of the way we were either brought up by our family or in the regions we're brought up where a particular religion is the case. It serves a, sh- a social function. And of course, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, but the fact that we once thought, like you said, volcanoes. I mean, even some argue that Yahweh was a volcanic deity, uh, potentially at some points within the Bible. He's mm-hmm. equivalent to a, a, a mountain god, uh, a storm god, uh, an all angry these, god. I don't know an what ang- you call yeah, it. yeah, a pissed off god. I Who screwed does- up. I didn't make the life the way I wanted to. I'm going to start again, even I though repent- I'm omnipotent and omniscient. <laughs> Yeah, and I repent that I made man, uh, but I'm not yeah. going to destroy them again uh, after this. Yes, Mm-mm. totally. Um, I just said that to say, like, once we started to get and explain, okay, now we know why earthquakes happen. And it's not, you know, titans under the earth that are bumping into the wall because there's mm-hmm. no d- no light beneath the earth. Uh, they're bumping into the wall, causing earthquakes. We've explained these things naturally. What I find happen is people want to project back anachronistically and say, oh, no, no, no. You read these literally. They never were meant literally. Um, This is an allegory. They knew that that wasn't the literal truth. They may not have cared about the scientific reality of it. It's all. that's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Whatever they want to do. I'm just saying they're carrying baggage. And like you said, if nine times out of ten we now know why hurricanes happen, uh, it's not because of homosexuality in California. It's, (laughs) you know, like. Yeah. Things like that, when you now know, okay, there's natural explanations. Yeah. I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head because I, I, I do agree. I think that the writers of ancient mythology did not intend for their, uh, for their mythology, their, their stories to be taken literally. It's just that humans have an inability to deal with, with the unknown, right? We need to explain things, whether we understand them or not. And, um, and so, and we also, we we're also storytelling species that we just are, we like stories. And so, we're going to create stories and we're going to talk about phenomena, what, 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 mm-hmm. what we fear, what we revere, what we, our desires, um, what we want to become. And we're going to, and you know, this is just what we do. And, uh, I think the problem is, you know, as you point out the, the literalistic, uh, interpretation of these things, which I, I don't think was necessarily intended, but I think was more recognized as a potential tool for oppression. And, um, and as you also said earlier, I think the main problem lies in what you were told in, in your formative years. You know, I, I feel very fortunate that I was not raised with any religion. And so when I became of like school going age and I heard what, you know, the that these worldviews existed, I was utterly perplexed. I'm talking even age six or so. I just like it sounded to me like Santa Claus and stuff like that. Like it sounded to me indistinguishable from other commonly accepted myths that mm-hmm. we know are just like, it sounded to me like, like Roman mythology too, or Greek mythology, which we all per- pretty much all agree is just stories. Right. Right. Uh, and so I just couldn't understand how there were all these stories, but then so many people think that this one, we got to go, this is the real one. We got to do this one. I just never understood that. And I think really the only explanation is, is early indoctrination. Um, 
Yeah. So that's unfortunately real, real the case. Real quick, super chat, far sight. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate the super chat. Yeah, by definition, supernatural things cannot be investigated by science, but then neither can they be examined by any other reliable method. So, yeah, that's true. I mean, it, it, there's so much BS going on out there, and it, people are taking advantage of this. I watched the recent, um, and, and we're getting off topic, but I want to get back on topic. Recent Dan Brown, uh, he does the whole mentalism, and he's an atheist. Yeah magician love his stuff he gave an atheist a religious experience and then mm -hmm. he tells her after after he like tricked her into it he's like listen i know that what you felt was authentic and real but he was like i want you to know that i literally synthetically created this experiment <laughs> liberal liberal usage of the term you i mean like yeah, it, huh? look we we all we have profound experiences and we experience the human condition and we yearn for infinity and we fear death. And we, you know, we, it's, I don't, I, I understand why religion arose and, and I don't, I don't hate, like, I, I think it was an important part of, 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 of the evolution of human civilization. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I don't seek to eradicate religion, honestly. I don't, I, you know, I think we'd be better off without it, quite frankly, but my, my, it's not my goal to yank anyone's religion from them, right? We like stories and we like rituals and we like feeling connected to the past. And, you know, that there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. I just want to take um, and I also have no problem with, pe with, with people who allow their religion to uh, to uh, to change over time uh, to 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 fit empirical science or right? to leave room for empirical science. If your religion does not infringe on science, I have absolutely no problem with it. You know, you, you can have your God and you can have your holidays and your prayer and your religion, all these things. Right. Prayer is essentially just meditation. I mean, these are we're, we're very complex organisms, humans. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're ritualistic and there's nothing wrong with that. But um, where where religion begins to deny the validity of empirical science, I have a problem and I step in and I try to uh, expose the lies and script of of, uh, of apologists and charlatans. And so I think they have a very, very negative influence on society and on mankind. So. So the real question is, is Ken Hoven your best friend? <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, a. I saw your video for anyone who hasn't seen it. You, like you take the time in your personal video when you play the one from modern day debate. I'm good friends with James, by the way. Um, and, uh, and you were like, listen, guys, I don't usually do this. And I'm not usually such a, you know, a jerk in a way, uh, <laughs> but I had to, this guy is spouting dangerous ideology. And he really, it really is. It's ridiculous. The stuff the guy says, I used to listen to him, by the way, I used yeah. to actually follow him as a Christian. And listen to what he said and believe a lot of people do. On, how come there's trees going through multiple stratum and you know Aaron Rod does a series on uh like debunking this guy i don't know if you've ever seen that or not yeah yeah no i mean i know i know Aaron and uh and i have seen some of his content yeah i mean he's well suited for for debunking that that sort of stuff yeah but yeah. i mean yeah kent i mean it, he's apologists are all the same i mean they, they just they have a script um and they want to deliver these fallacious talking points. The degree to which they know they're lying or not is, you know, d again, I'm not a psychologist, but I mean, Kent is definitely lying. <laughs> Kent is as big a con man as, as you can get. Um, and, uh, you know, y there's no other way. You One must be aggressive, probably with most apologists. I imagine probably with James, too, if I was to be one-on-one uh, -on -one with him, because uh, the, the stories I've heard, <laughs> people who, uh, the handful of people who, who have taken him up and gone into his office, he just ends up screaming them out of the out of his room. Mm -hmm. But uh, but Kent, I mean, you know, he, he lies five times per sentence. You, you got to cut him off and repeat it. I mean, there were multiple times in that exchange where I disproved what he said to his face. And then he just said it again. <laughs> it's yeah. like, are you out? Like, I think that's why, um, you know, and looking back, you know, I kind of wish I could have redone that one and, and stayed a little calmer, but, uh, but um, it's quite infuriating. I mean, the, the, he's just this brick wall. It's just like, this is my script of lies. This is my, uh, this is my livelihood. This is how I make money and you're not going to tear it down. I don't care how many truth bombs you throw at this brick wall. <laughs> I'm going to stay standing. And, uh, wow. it's, it's astounding. I, I was taken aback. I really wasn't prepared for that level. I knew he was a liar, but I wasn't ready for that level of dishonesty. <laughs> We're just like, I just explained why you're wrong to you very clearly. And then he just says it again. You believe you came from a rock. It's like, Oh my God. <laughs>
<laughs> I got to get out of here. <laughs> so but, what do you uh, say to someone who says, okay, the fossil records don't support that we come from other species, right? I know this is a, if you're going to explain um, how evolution works, it is complex. It's not mm -hmm. simple. Like it's almost yeah. easy to say something like all species are transitional species technically because sure. we're all transitioning over time. There's a change taking place and it's very minor. Sometimes I wonder yeah. if it's bigger at times when like the, the discrepancy would be that we label the ones transitional that are not extant, right? They're not here now. Right. Right. Yeah. But, so but how yes, would you explain that? You like the transitional fo fossil record isn't, uh, like you would think there's as many fossils, right? That, yeah. that people would expect. Why aren't, why aren't we just digging up all of these, like constantly digging yeah. up evidence of these transitional fossils? <laughs> well, we are, and they're there. People who say that don't even take five seconds to Google list of transitional fossils. You could do that, read one Wikipedia entry and just have your mind blown at how many transitional fossils we have. It's insane. Whatever, whatever transition you're talking about, right? From, from aquatic life to early land life, um, from from reptile to bird, uh, from you know from the 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 emergence of mammals and then you know the the progression of mammals from from land mammals back to sea mammals. We've got them all. Like I mean, not all, but we have hundreds between in, in between extant species, tons of them. You know, and um, I don't know. I mean, we could go anywhere from here. There's so many fallacious talking points. <laughs> that, yeah, that I'd love to see you throw up some of the some of the fallacious points that are brought up that are probably popular. Because one of the things I would want to say, if you could correct me if I'm wrong about this, but from what I understand, the fossilization is also mm -hmm. something that isn't as common as you would expect. Like people expect every species to just pop up and right. you have all this evidence. It's under certain special conditions in which fossilization is even a case. Like if you go kill someone and bury them in a forest where it's extremely moist, yeah. their bones aren't going to probably last a couple hundred thousand years. You're not going to have evidence that you buried that person in that woods. But if you took them to the Dead Sea area, let's just say, and buried them in the sand, you know, millions of years from now, you potentially might find this guy or under certain conditions fossilization happens. So it's not replete on the level that they would expect, but they're expecting this grand absolute every single imaginal imaginable fossil mm -hmm. like tr transitioning between us and our ancient cousins if you will like they want every single thing a, a mile long of every little tiny sequential difference yeah. in the human or not in the human but in yeah. evolution from us you know yeah obviously not every single organism fossilizes but um but but again they they haven't looked into it at all not even for 10 seconds because if they did they would find that it's there's a lot way more than they way more than they expect and more than enough to substantiate evolution right i mean it, it's just it's bizarre to me um that people <laughs> it's like what if evolution were not the case why is everything we find supportive of evolution right you would think that that there would be uh insurmountable gaps you would think that there would be similar organisms with like a different polymerase enzyme or something you know what i mean like something where it's just like well that's inexplicable i mean you know but no the lineage of you know on the molecular level on the cellular level on the organismal level everything is perfectly aligned with predictions of evolutionary biology um but that's why um that's why apologists like Kent, I mean, Kent is the most blatant of them. Uh, others, see, the movement now is to try to seem more scientific. So so Kent, even among creationists, is sort of a black sheep. They're like, yeah. that guy's a bozo. Like, he, he makes <laughs> us look really stupid, and they don't like him. Um, but then the other ones, uh, they try to appear very scientific. Um, but uh, in the end, there, you know, it, it, people still just go back to these ridiculous talk. Like, you have to have straw men because it's so flawlessly aligned with the predictions of evolutionary biology. You have to create straw men. So that when you go to Kent, you're talking about like, why doesn't a whale give birth to a pine tree or something? You know, it's like it's almost astounding <laughs> that <laughs> that something like that would have to, that you would have to answer a question like that. But then again, you know, <laughs> people people go yeah why doesn't a whale give birth to pun um and he's got uh, a point he's got a point but i mean you know you have to understand that there are these lineages and th the lineages are random right the, the the change is random over time and of course you must understand the basics about genetics right and and gene expression in order to understand how this can happen in the first place but um 
right to to all, all of the the random chance that has produced these lineages yes it would be insane first of all for the precise lineage to happen again somehow but of course not jumping you know 5 million speciation events at once that's insane right so when someone's i think that, you know the expectation among creationists is that one species should give birth to another species Okay, but what they're qualifying as different species is like a cat and a rhinoceros. You know, they're like, why? It's like, well, no one in their right mind would suggest that that is something that you should see. That is has nothing to do with evolution. If that happened, that would be a miracle. Mm -hmm. Then we would probably believe in God if a cat <laughs> gave birth to a rhinoceros, right? That's so, I you mean, know, the book of Enoch says that a... Um says, uh, I think something like this, a white calf gave birth to a ram or a uh, sheep or something like this. And mm -hmm. it says this in Josephus as one of the miracles that are listed in, in this mm -hmm. temple's destruction scene that a, a calf gave birth to like a lamb or something like that. But yeah, uh, so yeah, you're right. They would then go, see, we were right all yep. along. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I mean, first of all, yeah, I don't understand like any reference, any time you reference biblical scripture in a scientific debate, you're like, okay, you are admitting you lose. Like, you don't know, like, why would you do that? <laughs> but, um, but, but second of all, I, I, I think that this is a symptom of like, it's a very infantile and naive way of viewing uh, like if, if you look at colors, like let's say you're a little kid and you learn about colors, right? And you, okay, what are the colors? There's red, green, blue, yellow. You, there's like six colors, whatever. You're like, those are the colors. That's all the colors. Um, and I think that, that, uh, creationists kind of view life like that too. There's like, there's dogs and cats and bears and hippos and giraffes. And that's all the animals, right? Well, if you look at a color wheel, right? you find all of those gradations going from one color to the next, right? right. There's in infinitely divisible, right? You, you can go down to the pixel and you can see, you know, from blue to red, like we're hitting. So, and as you grow up and, and you get older, you learn about other shades and periwinkle and royal blue and chartreuse. And I, I don't know what all these colors are, but turquoise. turquoise. Yeah. We've named them, right? We've named them. And, and, and uh, those are arbitrary, right? We say this shade <laughs> is, uh, we made up a word for it, you know, but um, it's the same with life. If, if you look at, um, if you truly do actually try and go and like, what are the transitional species from, you know, aquatic life to early land life? And, and you, and we've found, we have many, many fossils, right? It, it is kind of analogous to that thing of like, oh, we're watching blue become red very slowly over, you know, hundreds of different intermediary shades. And the problem is that those are, you know, most of those are no longer extant species. So it's, if you don't, if you don't look into, if you don't look into this and you're just thinking, well, there's a fish and there's a squirrel. So what happened? How, you know, where, how did you get a squirrel from a fish? It's like, well, you know, do like try at all to find the answer to your question, try any amount at all. And I think you'll be surprised to find that it's, you know, where it's the internet age, all the information is there. Like you, you, you willful ignorance. I mean, ignorance is a choice in this day and age. All, everything that we know, is online and you may not understand all of it. If you want to understand it, then you got to learn some pre prerequisite information, but there's a lot of misinformation all there too, though. That's the pro is there's yeah. more information, misinformation than there is good. Let me, let me ask you this too. Um, Aaron raw in his series against Kent Hoven, which mm -hmm. dude, I, I can't wait to see you and him, like go on a video together, hanging out talking about evolution. That would be the bomb. You'd be able to understand each other a lot too, but just because you're outspoken on YouTube about this stuff, um, Arn Ra brought up this point against Kent, as you brought it up, and said, look, there are cats or dogs, he had a chart, that can't breed with one another, not even genetically, right? Mm -hmm. So he says, they're dogs, like you would look at it and go, that's a dog. Like, you know, you gotta, it's gotta be a cartoon book, uh, simple for them to see it. Yeah. And it's like, all right, there's a dog and there's another dog. You look at them and you go, that's the same. It's almost like a wolf, right? Wolf and a dog. There's some dogs that look like wolves. And for example, though, he showed that they don't genetically have a way of being able to mate and produce. They might hump each other, but I know dogs that try to hump cats. Okay. So does that make the, the, the it's just part of their nature. So my point mm -hmm. is, is like that makes them in a sense, a different species, even though they're under the same category in some way. Um, what do you do with that, Kent? And of course there's no real explanation. Dogs never uh, produce non-dogs. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the problem. Like he showed that there are dogs that can't produce with other dogs genetically. Yep. They're, they're too far away on the tree. 
for them to be able to, to yeah. mate and so, so this is the problem and this is the advantage that apologists have is they exclusively use language that is intelligible to people who don't understand, who don't know anything about science, um, which inevitably oversimplifies things in, in, a, in a deliberate and misleading way. Whereas any answer to such questions requires scientific terminology and scientific concepts that um, that people don't understand and and in many cases don't want to understand. They will refuse. So it's like you can, you know, Kent says cats and dogs. Okay, what do you mean? What do you mean cats and dogs? What, what give me like, you know, use, use taxa, you, right? You, we have a language in biology and we have specific taxa and they all have the Latin names and everything. What do you mean by cats and dogs, right? Are we talking about a family or are we talking, are you talking about a, spe a particular species, right? So, but it, when you want to counter those claims, which are fallacious, you have to use proper scientific terminology. And then there's a certain subset of people that will just boop, brain turns off, right. you're talking science, Science is evil. Science is wrong. I'm going to listen to Kent because he says cats and dogs, and I know what cats and dogs are, I think, right? Um, so that's the huge challenge in countering apologists is if they're clever, they construct arguments that uh, seem simple to understand but are wrong, and then any debunking of those will necessarily then require scientific information that people can just ignore because it triggers them in a way, you know, like, oh, you're reminding me of science class and I didn't like it and I'm not going to listen to you. Right. It, 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 it's sometimes it, it, the, the, the best apologists construct arguments whose responses are, are complicated enough that people will ignore them. Right. So we, it's hard for us to sometimes create those counter arguments that are as simple to understand as the lie. Right. That's the challenge. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully I, I haven't spent too much time with evolution specifically. I right. took kind of this detour into abiogenesis, but I think maybe in the future I'd like to do some kind of like a, a layperson's guide to debunking creationist claims about evolution or something like that. And just like take all, everything on answers in Genesis and like, this is wrong. Here's why this is wrong. Here's why this is wrong. Here's why. And, and make the, the answers are there. Other people have answered these already. Maybe I can make them even simpler though. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the goal. Um, it's yeah. always about making it. And you're really the best at simplifying. I think that's this. a skill I have. Yeah. So I'd yeah. like to try to, to put that to use in this particular realm. It's just hard because there's so much, like I took a big aside into physics and astrophysics and I was countering uh, a bunch of like quack astrophysics, I saw astrophysics your claims. Thunderbolt project. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Thunderbolts and, and these other guys, and and uh, and now you know I'm really fo I I, I uh, have a lot of focus on on the old health industry and like quack medical claims and stuff. There's just so much to do. It's like it's and then you know you're like evolution. I'm like oh yeah, I want to talk about that too. It's just there's so much and I, it's gonna take 50 years to like get through all this <laughs> stuff. But um, yeah, well, I, we'll I look try. forward to seeing your evolution stuff, and mm -hmm. I know that you're always going out of your way to like say this is not how you do science these are the problems that we see with these and i'm actually watching your thunderbolt project now because i know some friends of mine who've hey watch this man like it's going to turn yeah. everything upside down um if i could ask what are some of the big problems that you hear from theists about evolution that you would like to address maybe um we did the transitional fossils obviously we talked at yeah. least a little bit about it I mean, yeah, really just the misconceptions about, I mean, I, I, you know, I think a lot of it is just not a, like, I would like for theists, uh, I don't want to use the word theist. I want to say, right. you know, not like, all are, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can totally be a theist and be, you know, understand all kinds of science, uh, you know, young earth creationist or, or, you know, uh, evolution denier, I would say, um, if you could just learn, like watch my tutorials on nucleic acids and gene expression, um, because I think that uh, a lot of people don't, and, and not just uh, creationists. I mean, I think a lot of lay people that are not anti-science also don't really know what gene expression is um, and therefore don't know what DNA is, right? And so we all learn DNA is a genetic code and DNA is, okay, how? What, what are you talking, what does that mean, right? What is the process by which this qualifies as a code, right? And, uh, you know, protein uh, production. And, um so in general, and then also in an, in an embryonic sense, right? I mean, I think that, uh, you know, something I would like to harp on a little more with Ken, you're talking about, you know, how does this organism 
turn into this or, you know, first of all, it doesn't turn into, right? We're talking about a lineage of many, 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 uh, many generations, thousands, millions of generations in between. But, um, you know, um, uh, he, he was having a hard time uh, understanding how a unicellular organism becomes, uh, you know, varied multicellular organisms. Well, okay, uh, we all begin as one cell, right? We were all, all humans. We were once a zygote. We were one cell. All right. How did that zygote become a person mm -hmm. or whatever other organism? Um, and so you, you cannot you cannot begin to comprehend that process without understanding gene expression. Right. So you have, uh, you know, there's there's DNA there and uh, that is being read and, and producing proteins. And then and uh, these proteins carry out all kinds of cellular functions. So there, we're talking about specialization. Right. You have specialized cells and then. Uh, in terms of like creating limbs uh, in select regions, there's apoptosis going on. So, you know, we have, we have, uh, there's like webs and then it kind of, the cells die. And then it's, so it's being sculpted by, by these instructions. So very clearly, if you can have mutations and instructions change, the body plan can change, right? It's, it's, it, it, it once you start to understand gene expression, it's not really that crazy. It's not that hard to understand how, how bodily form can change. And then when you throw natural selection in there and you start looking at statistical dynamics and you're saying, well, the, there's all these uh, potentialities, there's all these different traits and behaviors uh, and those which lead to a higher probability of proliferation, a higher probability of survival and therefore producing offspring, those traits will predominate statistically. <laughs> it's just not, it becomes, I don't want to say trivial, but just not really that hard to 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 get you know mm. um and if and you're not, if you're not aware of it though i could see how this would be definitely yeah, complex so if you literally don't know what gene expression is then how could you possibly understand that and then obviously you know we we once we once none of us knew what gene expression was you know we once none of us knew what dna is we once none of us knew that molecules existed right so i mean i have a lot of sympathy for i mean i yeah, i get it that that we we used to not know things we used to not know anything and then slowly we knew things and now we know a lot i mean if we have to be like to be perfectly frank the the 20th century was astounding. If you look at what we knew in 1900 and what we knew in 2000 in every field of science, chemistry, biology, astronomy, we it, it it's it's crazy. It's crazy how much progress occurred in the 20th century and humanity's being left behind, unfortunately. Right? It, specialized knowledge in in any field is so far beyond what is intuitive or immediately comprehensible to the layperson, that it almost seems hopeless. And so some people understand that and have reverence for science and they go, well, I don't really get it, but you know, scientists are doing all these things and, and, you know, I'm going to just, I'm going to trust what scientists say uh, in some, in some capacity, whatever that may be. Um, but then there's people who react negatively to that and, and just sort of deny the entire edifice of science and call it all fake knowledge. Yeah. Um, ironically, on their computers over the internet, given to them by by science. You know, um, so it, it's a really interesting um, facet of human psychology that would lead to that kind of behavior. But it's prevalent. It's very prevalent, and it's wow. an enormous problem. And I think that's why science communication is emerging as a as a viable and very important profession right about now. Um, in fact, when I began science communication, I had never even heard that term before. I, I think around 2017, someone told me, oh, you're a science communicator. I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I am. That is what I am. Very cool. We need, we need people um, who can do it in a way that isn't just dry, too, because the way the world yeah. is working online, they, people want to watch, um, oh, we found a 30-foot giant. Like, it's a myth, but then they, oh, we found fossils of a 30 foot giant, but we don't have the bones. And like they go into these stories and it's all got the music and the people are communicating in such a way that it's got 3 million views. But the guy who's like, all right, uh, giants are a myth. And we know why this myth would have arose in the Middle East and go into the actual facts. You're yeah. usually dry and it's not as entertaining. And it's like, yeah, yeah it's got 3000 views, not 3 million. Um, real quick, got a few super chats and then uh, continue mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Sure. side, thank you again for the super chat. Uh, Nintir, I believe, equals Lady of Life. Lady of the Rib, Eve, equals Hebrew for Lady of Life. It's a Sumerian pun. Interesting. I did not know that. Uh, Alan Bird says, what does your guest think of Stephen Jay Gold's 
non-overlapping magisteria and of his theory of punctuated e equilibrium? Uh, I don't think I could comment necessarily. I mean, I, I am aware of the term, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know necessarily enough to comment. I think that if I'm not mistaken, Alan, Stephen J. Gould is a creationist. If I'm not mistaken, could be wrong, but correct me if I'm wrong here. Maybe that'll give us some insight onto. Yeah. I've, I've heard the, the name, but I just, yeah, I can't recall necessarily exactly. Okay. Awesome. Well, look, uh, I, I cut you off. I'll be looking for his uh, comment to respond here. Maybe he has something else up his sleeve that might allow you to, but do you have a comment on non-overlapping magisterium? No, I don't. I haven't. I don't recall what that means. Theory of punctuated equilibrium. I mean, I, you know, I, I yeah, I, I, I'm aware of like different rates of equilibrium. And, uh, I, I think maybe it has something to do with, you know, it, uh, like, uh, there can be very rapid equilibrium or there can be uh, sort of periods of rapid equilibrium with, with very slow equilibrium in between. Um, and so, I mean, th these are just different, these are just different phenomena, right? I mean, uh, evolutionary change, um, it, it depends on, on a lot of variables, right? It depends on the environment, right? And if, if organisms are very, very, very well suited for their environment, there maybe is not necessarily going to be very rapid change. There will be random change, right? But it's not quite as directed where you have, um, where you have change that is being directed towards fitting an ecological niche, right? So, I mean, if, when you have rapidly changing uh, conditions, you have, you have rapid evolution and, you know, there's all kinds of cycles. There's all kinds of geological cycles. And, and uh, so, you know, I'm not definitely not an expert on any of this, but um, yeah. I think, I think what it is is that some creationists are probably like, well, this guy says that, you know, evolution can happen really fast like this, or it happens really slow. So which is it? You know, it's like, well, all right, you, it's very, very, you know, it's a very unsophisticated way of looking at evolution. You know, they're just, it, it, you're trying to, they're trying to, uh, people try to poke holes just by finding what they think are contradictory statements when they're just, they're not, you know? So, yeah. And I've heard that too. I mean, I want, I would suspect environment and the pressures of the particular environment in which you're living are going to create certain circumstances that will cause that organism to steer in certain directions and it might force it to do so quicker. I don't know, mm -hmm. but uh, like we stop using our pinkies, uh, we'll end up with four fingers. Maybe, I don't know, or something would probably happen to be different. Well, it's, it's harder to, it's harder to extrapolate that to humans because we're not, we, we're not participating in natural selection the way that uh, life was prior to human civilization. Uh, so it, it becomes a lot tricky and a lot trickier and more complicated to talk about what, about human evolution um because that that primary mechanism of natural selection it's it does not apply to us anymore right we if you're if you are um very weak and slow you don't get eaten by a tiger we all live in houses and <laughs> no it's, it's fine we have we have police and we have all these institutions set up to protect one another uh which is good that's uh you know because the the physically weaker or less fit may have uh, other ways to to uh to provide or, you know, other value to, uh, to humanity. So, um, that's, that's a great thing, but, um, uh, sorry, what were we talking about just before that? Environment, oh. environment in which you're in might cause. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, rapid. I can't, can't have that dumb thing where uh, I was like, I was grilling him on meiosis and he's like meiosis, but why didn't rabbits grow wings? And it's like, <laughs> Oh my uh, god! But it, but that's the kind of straw man, you know. It's like, oh, I can conceive of some magical thing that an organism could have that would make it better. Um, all right, well, are rabbits well suited for their environment? They're alive right now, so yes, they are. So apparently, they you know they run fast enough that uh, you know. But um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's no, just there's, there's a lot there. You know, I've watched a, a documentary where I can't remember what the name of it was. They're trying to find ways to modify the genome to help people like who are born with some type of disabilities or whatnot, they found ways to kind of splice. You probably know more about this or have heard about it to splice the genome in that particular area to fix a certain gene so that someone who's going to potentially be born blind or have something else going on, they're fixing it. And there's this huge controversy about us playing God, so to speak with our genes, especially when we're entering into something in the evolutionary process, because we sometimes might could do something and not be able to reverse it and potentially cause extinction or something super dangerous to us. Um, 
they were talking about destroying all mosquitoes because so much malaria that happens in Africa, for example. I don't know if you know about this documentary I'm talking about, but mm -hmm. the, playing into that, does that also kind of um, in, analogously go over to the whole idea of life evolving abiogenesis wise? Like, for example, when we're in the lab trying to create life as we define it now from these compounds, um, is it more difficult to try and create life in a laboratory than it would have been under natural circumstances, us trying to play God, so to speak, than just nature playing God itself? Does that make sense? Kind of. I mean, it depends how you qualify. I mean, we have sentience. So, I mean, obviously it's way, way immeasurably harder to just make a bunch of molecules come together and form life because mm -hmm. nature never did that either. That's right. insane. But we have the, we have the tool of sentience Right. We, that's why we can synthesize molecules that nature never figured out how to make, because we can deliberately elect to take things and put them in a in a glass vessel and heat it up, cool it down, use catalysts, whatever we want. You know, so we have sentience. Um, but that doesn't necessarily relate to. Sorry, what were you the, a, a moment before that? You were saying something else. Um, and are you talking about with the genes? Oh yeah, yeah, stuff? genes. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. See, I, this is a this is. This is a perfect example for for why it is so imperative that we get very baseline public science literacy because we're going into an era where, you know, genetic engineering it's a reality, right? CRISPR is astounding yes. technology. Right. CRISPR is astounding technology, and it's only going to get better to the point where we can alter the genome of any cell and therefore, by extension, any organism at will. Uh, and the ramifications for this are are they're mind boggling. Um, and we need to make sure that we use it wisely. Um, and the less people understand about it, the more easily they will be manipulated. Uh, let's say someone wants to use the technology for some kind of nefarious intent. All they have to do is create a propaganda campaign that tricks people into thinking that they're doing something good. Mm. Right. Uh, and also smears those who accurately uh, protest it, right? Uh, and if the public does not understand anything that they're talking about, then it just becomes how effective is your advertising campaign, right? Did you hit all those little buttons? You know, did you trigger fear? Did you right? Did you do all these things? Um, and then their their lie becomes uh, adopted as uh, as truth. Right? That's that's all it is. But if you the the more the public understands basic biochemistry and biology, the more readily they will be available to see through something and not be manipulated. And then that movement will not be able to gain traction because we'll be able to push legislature and we'll be able to neutralize it. Right. And, uh, you know, we, you know, <laughs> we don't want to do eugenics. We don't want to do, you know, um, but, but we may want to eliminate certain, uh, certain genetic diseases, right? Maybe we want to do that. I, I don't know, right? Th this gets mm -hmm. into very trickle, tr tr uh, troublesome ethical terrain. Right. Um, That's what I was getting at. Yeah. Yeah. And so we want to, it's incredible technology and we want to use it, but how are we going to use it? Right. We have to be, we have to have a very, uh, very earnest and conscientious decision about things like this. And we have to all be having this conversation, not just the select few people that truly understand it and stand to profit from it. Right. We need to all be able to add on to, to some level, be able to have this conversation or it's going to run away from us. And, uh, you know, I fear like we, we I don't believe that we're going to be find ourselves in, a, in an authoritarian regime 50 years from now. But if you if you think for a second that it's impossible and you turn your back to that possibility, you know, it's it's not impossible. Yeah, it is possible. And we have to be vigilant and we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. And ignorance is the fastest way to fall into that into that kind of a trap, you know. Interesting. So. Super chat from Mark. He's thanks for the super chat. He says he's just not prepared for real science questions. Okay. I think, like I think he's talking about you. I don't know. I think he's talking about you. I don't know. Mark, I appreciate the super chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Farsight super chat. Yes, because nature would have way more time to play around. So the whole like, why can't we make something like what we think the original would have looked like? And this is so kindergarten for me to even say it this way because when you talk about the color spectrum for example mm -hmm. like what do you mean by now we see it oh this is this is an actual cell like a full developed cell is there like a proto cell that we're not aware of how to identify at this moment or we're not sure what that would actually look like can we create something like that well 
it doesn't seem like we have. I don't know. I'm not a chemist. I haven't no, played not ab initio. No, we have, right. of course. But if you have, let's say, hundreds of millions or more of years to do this, then obviously we probably could. Do you think we'll be able to do something like that within the next hundred years with the science that we're at? Probably, yes. But again, I mean, honestly, for the third time here, it doesn't really have anything to do with origin of life research, right? The, 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 the process it, in synthetic chemistry, that's a field and there are mm -hmm. synthetic uh, chemists that are, that are working on this uh, or synthetic biologists, I should say, sorry, synthetic biology uh, is a field uh, that is working on that. Um, but, but the process of learning how to construct a, a system that we, that could be called a living organism from scratch. It, again, it just, it does not really have anything to do with abiogenesis. So earlier I was talking a couple of times about systems chemistry mm -hmm. and how we, um, understand how those, those simplest biopolymers can have arisen and encapsulated in vesicles, right? So imagine you have a vesicle and you have some RNA in there and you have some proteins and that's not life. Uh, but then uh, over time, due to replicative processes, they refine in such a way such that it eventually becomes something that you would call a living protocell, right? Um, you know, I'm not equipped necessarily as as leaders in the field in systems chemistry would be able to describe that process. Uh, but again, I, I showed some very key papers uh, in the field in that response to James Tour um, from Jack Shostak, some other people uh, of that stature. Um and so that's it. I mean, I, 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 I'm not equipped to turn this into a lecture in systems chemistry, right, <laughs> but, right. but that's what it is. You have systems of molecules that are complexifying over time uh, uh, until it becomes a system with the biochemical processes required, uh, metabolism and so forth, that would allow that system to be qualified as something that we would call life, right? Um, and unfortunately, synthetic biology as as incredible of a, of a field as that is it they're just not really i mean they're obviously somewhat related but i think that creationists want to pretend that they're the same field and they're not so anytime a creationist says why can't scientists make a cell it's like all right you don't even know what the goals of the field are you you don't even know the what what you're criticizing you don't even know what these people are doing let alone have you like actually read the papers or anything i mean you can't i mean they're hard to read um so yeah that's something that i tried to make quite abundantly clear right. in uh in my in my response there to james so if i may for someone simple-minded like me on these topics when I when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking to myself, OK, I just know how throughout history, how Christian apologists, I'm using Christians as an example, but there's many versions of this, whether they're from the Islam faith or, you know, Judaism, you name it. Um, they always kind of push God to a more complex you know, thing is, well, he's not like a man. He's beyond your comprehension. It's unimaginable. Well, if you read some of the Old Testament does seem kind of like a man, but just a little enhanced. Yeah. But so uh, I make the point like, and I get a lot of experts, PhDs who come on and talk about the Bible and all these ancient religions. Um, I got off track. So when I, when I'm looking at this and I say, okay, if they could produce, let's say a proto cell, or even we were able to somehow create in a lab using all these non living organic matter, here we go, combining it. And next thing you know, we have a cell, then someone, let's say Dr. James Tor. Uh, he his whole theory would go, well, the chemistry is already there. God already has all the building blocks there. So there's yeah. always another cop. They'll out. have a response. Yeah, they'll have a response. And I think we will do that. I don't know when. I might not be alive, but you know, I think we will do that. But yeah, then Kent Hoven will just say, well, it didn't turn into a zebra. So mm, you know, it's like they'll all have something ridiculous to say. It, it has nothing to do with science. It's just a, it's just a script. It's just a script to divert attention. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a very desperate, uh, attempt to deny science and it, it's just science. It's just blanket science denial. So it doesn't really matter what the status of science is. I mean, it was a lot easier to deny, to, to deny science in 1850, right? <laughs> they didn't have as much to point to. Um, and it's going to get harder and harder as, as science progresses. But if you really, really want to deny science, you're going to find a way to deny science, right? You can just, just here you go. None of this is real, you know, and it doesn't really matter what the status of science is. It doesn't matter if a proto cell has been synthesized or how, or wh what what a biogen uh, a biogenesis which which of the pathways we've we've uh, shown to be plausible or or what have you. You know, it's just specialized knowledge that somebody can say 
nope, that's not real. I mean, I deal with flat earthers and there's millions of um, images of the earth from space and they go, nope, CGI, not real. Okay, this was taken with a film photographic camera. This is this was taken on film in the 1960s. Nope, CGI. You know what I mean? Like, if you really want to be that person, there's no amount of science that's going to going to get you to acknowledge reality. <laughs> you know, it's uh, clearly something very personal that you're that you're identifying with. It's your it's become something. It's an identity, right? This is an identity mm -hmm. that you're clinging to, and uh, at that point, facts are not really going to help much. Um, so. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. And I plan on doing, hopefully we get a chance. I plan on uh, having you come on and to do the flat earth discussion. Uh, I'll try and put some actual questions together, though. That okay, really good. That way you're kind of like prepared on knowing where I'm going. But you do one of the most clear. And I mean, there's a lot of debunking flat earth videos out there, but like <laughs> you're so like spot on, man. I really appreciate it. So hopefully we have you come on. BJ Chadwick, thank you for the super chat. It says thanks for your videos. I believe that's what, what they're trying to say. And I did a video yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. I released this public with Dr. Joshua Bowen. The Bible teaches flat earth. It actually does. Uh, because it's ancient Near Eastern cosmology. And he's pointing out like the Bible is in the same milieu as the ancient Near Eastern literature. So that doesn't mean the whole Bible. That just mm -hmm. ancient Hebrew Genesis is in the same milieu. Um, what do you do with that? Well, these guys. I wonder if Kent thinks the earth is flat or does he think flat earthers are wackos and that he's no, somehow he, not? He doesn't. Yeah. He hates flat earthers. Huh? It's weird. Mm -hmm. how, it's weird how this works, you know? Well, the, even someone as unscientific as him tries to gain some scientific high ground by mocking, you know, admittedly as dumb, you know, as ridiculous as, as, uh, as young earth creationism is, it's not as dumb as flat earth. <laughs> so wow. flat earth really is the king. It really is the number one, just indefensible, you know, debunkable by looking at objects and thinking, uh, truly insane thing to believe. <laughs> so your video about the moon and, mm -hmm. uh, and going through solar and lunar eclipses and whatnot showing if this was, it just is, is well done. It was really mm -hmm. well done. I, I I really look forward to that. Another super chat. S. J. Gold was a famous evolutionist, so I had that wrong. I um, yeah, I didn't know. no, yeah, I had a, a I I was remembering him as as a biologist, but uh, yeah, with punctuated equilibrium, that's that's a dead giveaway. But um, yeah, I should read up a bit before I do my uh, uh anti evolution talking point takedown. <laughs> <laughs> well, he really. Yeah obviously said it would be a great read he thinks you would love so thank mm -hmm. you alan for that and professor dave i seriously appreciate this look i um we got we got one more super chat popped up mm -hmm. uh and then we're gonna wrap things up here uh really want to do the flat earth thing with you sometime soon Nick nikolai says what's your opinion on apologists like craig mcrath and collins are they doing more good than bad for science uh, I don't know who those people are, but William I, Lane Craig, you know, William Lane Craig, he's, Oh, that rings a bell. But, uh, yeah, no, I cannot imagine that any apologist would be doing anything good for science. So I would have to say no. Interesting. Cause I know he thinks old earth, right. But then maybe a theistic evolution, uh, position, I would think. And that's a whole different discussion. I think to have you poke in, I'm sure you've mm -hmm. heard theistic evolution ideas, right? Uh, I mean, not just I, that God zapped it and then left it alone. Like it's like God's actively involved. And to me, that does sound mm -hmm. silly with what you said earlier. Like, hold on. Yeah, I mean, so it took him millions of years to actively be involved to finally get it to where we are. It, you know, today it's, it's like, Hmm, what should I do next? Like, I thought your God was omniscient. <laughs> what are you talking about? Wow. You know? More than millions, sometimes billions. I mean, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. universe is so old. So anyways, um, thank you so much. I ask that everybody goes. And once again, here's the YouTube channel. Please go check him out. He talks about a lot more than what we're talking about today. He debunks so many things. I mean, look at these videos, right? Like, there's a ton of videos. I'm scrolling pretty fast there, by the way. Uh, lots of subscribers, man. Seriously, keep up the good work. I look forward to seeing you like way, way up there. You know, catch up to like Joe Rogan. <laughs> yeah, and that would be something. I'd be subscribe. satisfied to just be a guest of his. <laughs> hey, that would be cool. I'd like to mm -hmm. make that happen. But I'm afraid unless you're saying aliens are what we're recently seeing on camera, you're probably not going to show up there. 
you might have an ayahuasca entrance. You could say, look, uh, <laughs> I'll come on and take some psychedelics and uh, we can make the show happen. I just Oof. don't know if it would happen. I, I don't know about live on camera. I'm no stranger to hallucinogens, but uh, very much in private. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd have a bad trip on camera or something. That'd be bad. Yeah. No, Not a stranger really. either. Go uh, check out his Patreon if you want to help support what he's doing and you believe in uh, what he's trying to do to help better society and understanding science overall it's not just one topic and debunking a lot of the pseudo claims that are out there um you can join him on his patreon also get his book is this wi-fi organic make sure you guys check his book out it's not expensive on kindle paperback's not expensive and who reads it on audible do you oh yeah yeah i narrated it awesome so mm -hmm. i'll have to pick up some time and, and check out the audiobook you said it's mainly about like debunking all these pseudo claims scientific yeah, I mean, I give kind of those uh, those qualifying passages, just like here's the very basics about chemistry, here's the very basics about biochemistry, biology, physics, and then we apply that knowledge to right. This claim is a scam because here's why it uh, contradicts this very basic basic uh, knowledge in biology or whatever it is. Yeah, awesome. Check out his book. Of course, I always like to plug my guest material so you guys know where you can help support them. These are ways in which you can help Dr. Farina. Am I going to say in the last name yet? Farina? I don't have a doctorate, but yeah, Farina. Oh, okay, professor. Sorry. That was a Just question Dave that came is in fine. the chat. Someone was like, is he really a professor? I and, used to uh, teach at, uh, at a, I taught organic chemistry at a university, and now I'm a science communicator. So, I mean, it's, uh, my channel is called Professor Dave Explains. Uh, I'm, I just go by Dave. Yeah. But, uh, okay, I should have asked you that up front. That's fine. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> Everybody can... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Call me whatever you want. Yeah. Check out the Patreon, Myth Vision. Guys, I've got like, I don't even know how many videos I'm editing right now. I've got like maybe 20, 20 something videos that are going to be released here on the Patreon. You can also help support that and join there. Thank you for your time, your energy, and coming on with your insight. I did not want this to be overhead because when I wrote you last week, I was like, do you think we can do some visuals? And like, I don't have any visuals prepared. I'm like, then we don't want to get too deep. Because mm -hmm. really, without a visual, um, this stuff we've already gone over many people's heads, probably who are going to watch this. So uh, I really yeah. appreciate that. I'd rather direct people to to. I put a lot of work into into the debunk. So if you're you know if you want to learn more about abiogenesis, check out my recent two part response uh, to James. I put a lot of work into that and referenced all the. Uh, there's a lot of great visuals in there. Uh, I just to 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 build them for for a podcast, maybe not so much. But I love talking, so I love uh, having a chat. Definitely, I'll do that anytime. Well, I'm glad you came and checked this out, man. Mm -hmm. I hope you don't mind that the gods came to check out what we were doing today. Um, you know, one more time, I guess I'll show them. And if you don't mind, hold on one second as mm -hmm. we leave, uh, just so we could chat before uh, I let you go.